Chapter 10. For three or four days, they saw very little of Marge except down at the beach, and she was noticeably cooler towards both of them on the beach. She smiled and talked just as much or maybe more, but there was an element of politeness now, which made for the coolness. Tom noticed that Dickie was concerned, though not concerned enough to talk to Marge alone, apparently, because he hadn't seen her alone since Tom had moved into the house. Tom had been with Dickie every moment since he had moved into Dickie's house. Finally, Tom, to show that he was not obtuse about Marge, mentioned to Dickie that he thought she was acting strangely. Oh, she has moods, Dickie said. Maybe she's working well. She doesn't like to see people when she's in a streak of work. The Dickie-Marge relationship was evidently just what he had supposed it to be at first, Tom thought. Marge was much fonder of Dickie than Dickie was of her. Tom, at any rate, kept Dickie amused. He had lots of funny stories to tell Dickie about people he knew in New York. Some of them true, some of them made up. They went for a sail in Dickie's boat every day. There was no mention of any date when Tom might be leaving. Obviously, Dickie was enjoying his company. Tom kept out of Dickie's way when Dickie wanted to paint, and he was always ready to drop whatever he was doing and go with Dickie for a walk or a sail or simply sit and talk. Dickie also seemed pleased that Tom was taking his study of Italian seriously. Tom spent a couple of hours a day with his grammar and conversation books. Tom wrote to Mr. Greenleaf that he was staying with Dickie now for a few days and said that Dickie had mentioned flying home for a while in the winter and that probably he could by the time persuade him to stay longer. This letter sounded much better now that he was staying at Dickie's house than his first letter in which he had said he was getting at uh, staying at a hotel in Mangiabello. Tom also said that when his money gave out, he intended to try to get himself a job, perhaps at one of the hotels in the village, a casual statement that served the double purpose of reminding Mr. Greenleaf that $600 could run out, and also that he was a young man ready and willing to work for a living. Tom wanted to convey the same good impression to Dickie, so he gave Dickie the letter to read before he sealed it. Another week went by of ideally pleasant weather, ideally lazy days in which Tom's greatest physical exertion was climbing the stone steps from the beach every afternoon, and his great mental effort trying to chat in Italian with Fausto, the 23-year-old Italian boy whom Dickie had found in the village and had engaged to come three times a week and give Tom Italian lessons. They went to Capri one day in Dickie's sailboat. Capri was just far enough away not to be visible from Mangiabello. Tom was filled with anticipation, but Dickie was in one of his preoccupied moods and refused to be enthusiastic about anything. He argued with the keeper of the dock where they tied the pipistrello. Dickie didn't even want to take a walk through the wonderful-looking little streets, that went off in every direction from the plaza. They sat in a cafe on the plaza and drank a couple of Fernet Brancas, and then Dickie wanted to start home before it became dark, though Tom would have willingly paid their hotel bill if Dickie had agreed to stay overnight. Tom supposed they would come again to Capri, so he wrote that day off and tried to forget it. A letter came from Mr. Greenleaf, which had crossed Tom's letters, in which Mr. Greenleaf reiterated his arguments for Dickie's coming home, which Tom success, and asked for a prompt reply as to his results. Once more, Tom dutifully took up the pen and replied. Mr. Greenleaf's letter had been in such a shocking business-like tone, really as if he had been checking on a shipment of boat parts, Tom thought that he found it very easy to reply in the same style. Tom was a little high when he wrote the letter because it was just after lunch and they were always slightly high on wine just after lunch, a delicious sensation that could be corrected at once with a couple of espressos and a short walk 
or prolonged with another glass of wine, sipped as they went about their leisurely afternoon routine. Tom amused himself by injected a faint hope in this letter. He wrote in Mr. Greenleaf's own style. If I am not mistaken, Richard is wavering in his decision to spend another winter here. As I promise you, I shall do everything in my power to dissuade him from spending another winter here. And in time, though it may be as long as Christmas, I may be able to get him to stay in the States when he goes over. Tom had to smile as he wrote it because he and Dicky were talking of cruising around the Greek islands this winter, and Dicky had given up the idea of flying home even for a few days, unless his mother should be really seriously ill by then. They had talked also of spending January and February, Mangibello's worst month, in Mallorca, and Marge would not be going with them, Tom was sure. Both he and Dickie excluded her from their travel plans whenever they discussed them, though Dickie had made the mistake of dropping to her that they might be taking a winter cruise somewhere. Dickie was so damned open about everything, and now, though, Tom knew Dickie was still firm about them going alone. Dickie was being more than usually attentive to Marge, just because he realized that she would be lonely here by herself, and that it was essentially unkind of them not to ask her along. Dickie and Tom both tried to cover it up by impressing on her that they would be traveling in the cheapest and worst possible way around Greece, cattle boats, sleeping with peasants on the decks and all that. No way for a girl to travel. But Marge still looked dejected, and Dickie still tried to make up by asking her often to the house now for lunch and dinner. Dickie took Marge's hand sometimes as they walked up from the beach, though Marge didn't always let him keep it. Sometimes she extricated her hand after a few seconds in a way that looked to Tom as if she were dying for her hand to be held. And when they asked her to go along with them to the Herculaneum, she refused. I think I'll stay home. You boys enjoy yourself, she said with an effort as a cheerful smile. Well, if she won't, she won't, Tom said to Dickie, and drifted tactfully into the house so that she and Dickie could talk alone on the terrace if they wanted to. Tom sat on the broad windowsill in Dickie's studio and looked out at the sea, his brown arms folded on his chest. He loved to look out at the sea, the blue Mediterranean, and think of himself and Dickie sailing where they pleased. Tangiers, Sophia, Cairo, Sevastopol. By the time his money ran out, Tom thought, Dickie would probably be so fond of him and so used to him that he would take it for granted they would go on living together. He and Dickie could easily live on Dickie's 500 a month income. From the terrace, he could hear a pleading tone in Dickie's voice and Marge's monosyllabic answer. Then he heard the gate clang. Marge had left. She had been going to st stay for lunch. Tom shoved himself off the windowsill and went out to Dickie on the terrace. Was she angry about something? Tom asked. No, she feels kind of left out, I suppose. We certainly try to include her. It isn't just this, Dickie was walking slowly up and down the terrace. Now she says she doesn't even want to go to Cortina with me. Oh, she'll probably come around about Cortina before December. I doubt it, Dickie said. Tom supposed it was because he was going to Cartina, too. Dickie had asked him last week. Freddie Miles had been gone when they got back from their Rome trip. He had had to go to London suddenly. Marge had told them. But Dickie had said he would write Freddie that he was bringing a friend along. Do you want me to leave, Dickie? Tom asked, sure that Dickie didn't want him to leave. I feel I'm intruding on you and Marge. Of course not. Intruding on what? Well, from her point of view. No, it's just that I owe her something, and I haven't been particularly nice to her lately. We haven't. Tom knew he meant that he and Marge had kept each other company over the long jury last winter, when they had been the only Americans in the village, and that he shouldn't neglect her now because somebody else was here. Suppose I talk to her about going to Cortina, Tom suggested. Then she surely won't go, Dickie said tersely, and went into the house. 
Tom heard him telling Emmerlinda to hold the lunch because he wasn't ready to eat yet. Even in Italian, Tom could hear that Dickie said he wasn't ready for lunch, in the master of the house tone. Dickie came out on the terrace, sheltering his lighter as he tried to light his cigarette. Dickie had a beautiful silver lighter, but it didn't work well in the slightest breeze. Tom finally produced his ugly flaring lighter, as ugly and efficient as a piece of military equipment, and lighted it for him. Tom checked himself from proposing a drink. It wasn't his house, though as it happened, he had bought the three bottles of Gilbreeze that now stood in the kitchen. It's after two, Tom said. Want to take a little walk and go by the post office? Sometimes Luigi opened the post office at 2.30, sometimes not until four. They can never tell. They walked down the hill in silence. What had Marge said about him, Tom wondered. The sudden weight of guilt made sweat come out on Tom's forehead, an amorous yet very strong sense of guilt, as if Marge had told Dickie specially that he had stolen something or had done some other shameful thing. Dickie wouldn't be acting like this only because Marge had behaved coolly, Tom thought. Dickie walked in his slouching downhill gait that made his bony knees just out in front of him. A gait that Tom had unconsciously adopted, too. But now Dickie's chin was sunk down on his chest, and his hands were rammed into his pockets of his shorts. He came out silently only to greet Luigi and thank him for his letter. Tom had no mail. Dickie's letter was from a Naples bank, a form slip on which Tom saw typewritten in blank space, $500. Dickie pushed the slip carefully into his pocket and dropped the envelope into a waste bucket. The monthly announcement that Dickie's money had arrived in Naples, Tom supposed. Dickie had said that his trust company sent his money to a Naples bank. They walked on down the hill, and Tom assumed that they would walk up the main road to where it curved around a cliff on the other side of the village, as they had done before. But Dickie stopped at the steps that led up to Marge's house. I think I'll go up to see Marge, Dickie said. I won't be long, but there's no use in you waiting. Oh, all right, Tom said, feeling suddenly desolate. He watched Dickie climb a little way up the steep steps cut into the wall. Then he turned abruptly and started back towards the house. About halfway up the hill, he stopped with an impulse to go down to Giorgio's for a drink. But Giorgio's martinis were just absolutely terrible. And with another impulse to go up to Marge's house, and on a pretense of apologizing to her, bent his anger by surprising them and annoying them. He suddenly felt that Dickie was embracing her, or at least touching her, at this minute, and partly he wanted to see it, and partly he loathed the idea of seeing it. He turned and walked back to Marge's gate. He closed the gate carefully behind him, though her house was so far above she could not possibly have heard it, then ran up the steps two at a time. He slowed as he climbed the last flight of steps, he would say, Look here, Marge, I'm sorry I've been causing the strain around here. We asked you to go today, and we mean it. I mean it. Tom stopped at Marge's window, came into view. Dickie's arms was around her waist. Dickie was kissing her, little peck on the cheek, smiling at her. They were only about 15 feet from him, but the room was shadowed compared to the bright sunlight he stood in, and he had to strain to see. Now Marge's face was tipped straight up to Dickie's, as if she were fairly lost in ecstasy. And what disgusted Tom was that he knew Dickie didn't mean it, that Dickie was only using this cheap, obvious, easy way to hold on to her friendship. What disgusted him was the big bulge of her behind in the peasant skirt below Dickie's arm that circled his waist. And Dickie, Tom really would have believed it possible of Dickie. Tom turned away and ran down the steps, wanting to scream. He banged the gate shut. He ran all the way up the road home and arriving, gasping, supporting himself on the parapet after he entered Dickie's gate. He sat on the couch in Dickie's studio for a few moments, his mind stunned and blank. That kiss. It hadn't looked like a first kiss. He wanted to Dickie's easel, unconsciously avoiding looking at the bad painting that was on it, picked up the kneaded eraser that lay on the palette and flung it violently out of the window, saw it arc down and disappear toward the sea. 
He picked up more erasers from Dickie's table, pen points, smudge sticks, charcoal, and pastel fragments, and threw them one by one in corners or out of the window. He had a curious feeling that his brain remained calm and logical and that his body was out of control. He ran out to the terrace with an idea of jumping on to the parapet and doing a dance or standing on his head, but the empty space on the other side of the parapet stopped him. He went up to Dickie's room and paced around for a few moments, his hands in his pockets. He wondered when Dickie was coming home, or was he going to stay and make an afternoon of it, really take her to bed with him. Ugh! He jerked Dickie's closet door open and looked in. There was a freshly pressed, new-looking gray flannel suit that he had never seen Dickie wearing. Tom took it out. He took off his knee-length shorts and put on the gray flannel trousers. He put on a pair of Dickie's shoes. Then he opened the bottom drawer of the chest and took out a clean blue and white striped shirt. He chose a dark blue silk tie and knotted it carefully. The suit fitted him. He reparted his hair and put the part a little more to one side the way Dickie wore his. Marge, you must understand that I don't love you, Tom said into a mirror in Dickie's voice, with Dickie's high pitch on the emphasized words, with the little growl in his throat at the end of the phrase that could be pleasant or unpleasant, intimate or cool, according to Dickie's mood. Marge, stop it, Tom turned suddenly and made a grab in the air as if he were seizing Marge's throat. He shook her, twist her, while she sank lower and lower, until at last he left her, limp on the floor. He was panting. He wiped his forehead the way Dickie did, reaching for a handkerchief and not finding any, got one from Dickie's top drawer, then resumed in front of the mirror. Even his parted lips looked like Dickie's lips when he was out of breath from swimming, drawn down a little from his lower teeth. You know why I had to do that, he said, still breathlessly, addressing Marge, though he watched himself in the mirror. You were interfering between Tom and me. No, not that, but there is a bond between us. He turned, stepped over the imaginary body, and went stealthily to the window. He could see beyond the bend of the road the blurred slant of the steps that went up to Marge's house level. Dickie was not on the steps or on the parts of the road that he could see. Maybe they were sleeping together, Tom thought with a tighter twist of disgust in his throat. He imagined it awkward, clumsy, unsatisfactory for Dickie, and Marge loving it. She loved it even if he tortured her. Tom darted back to the closet again and took a hat from the top shelf. It was a little gray Tyrolean hat with a green and white feather in the brim. He put it on rakishly. It surprised him how much he looked like Dickie with the top part of his head covered. Really, it was only his darker hair that was very different from Dickie's. Otherwise, his nose, or at least the general form, his narrow jaw, his eyebrows, if he held them right. What you're doing? Tom rolled around. Dickie was at the doorway. Tom realized that he must have been right below at the gate when he had looked out. Oh, just amusing myself, Tom said in a deep voice he always used when he was embarrassed. Sorry, Dickie. Dickie's mouth opened a little, then closed, as if anger churned his words too much for them to be uttered. To Tom, it was just as bad as if he had spoken. Dickie advanced to the room. Dickie, I'm sorry if it... The violent slam of the door cut him off. Dickie began opening his shirt, scowling, just as he would have if Tom had not been there, because this was his room. And what was Tom doing in it? Tom stood petrified with fear. I wish you'd get out of my clothes, Dickie said. Tom started undressing, his fingers clumsily with his mortification, his shock, because up until now, Dickie had always said wear this and wear that that belonged to him. Dickie would never say it again. Dickie looked at Tom's feet. Shoes, too? Are you crazy? No, Tom tried to pull himself together as he hung up the suit. Then he asked, did you make it up with Marge? Marge and I are fine, Dickie snapped, in a way that shut Tom out from them. Another thing I want to say, but clearly, he said, looking at Tom, I'm not queer. I don't know if you had that idea that I am or not. Queer? Tom smiled faintly. I never thought you were queer. 
Dicky started to say something else and didn't. He straightened up the ribs, showing his dark chest. Well, Mars thinks you are. Why? Tom felt the blood go out of his face. He kicked off Dickie's second shoe feebly and set the pair in the closet. Why should she? What have I ever done? He felt faint. Nobody ever said it outright to him. Not in that way. It's just the way you act, Dickie said in a growling tone and went out the door. Tom hurried back into his shorts. He had been half concealing himself from Dickie behind the closet door, though he had his underwear on, just because Dickie liked him, Tom thought. Marge had lodged at his filthy accusations of him at Dickie, and Dickie hadn't had the guts to stand up and deny it to her. He went downstairs and found Dickie fixing himself a drink at the bar shelf on the terrace. Dickie, I want to, you to get this straight, Tom began. I'm not queer either, and I don't want anybody thinking I am. Oh, all right, Dickie growled. The tone reminded Tom of the answers Dickie had given him when he had asked Dickie if he knew this person or that in New York. Some of the people he asked Dickie about were queer, it was true, and he had often suspected Dickie of deliberately denying knowing them when he did know them. All right, who was making an issue of it anyway? Dickie was. Tom hesitated while his mind tossed in a welter of things he might have said, Bitter things, consolatory things, grateful and hostile. His mind went back to certain groups of people he had known in New York. Known and dropped, finally, all of them, but he regretted now having even known them. They had taken him up because he amused them, but he never had anything to do with any of them. When a couple of them had made a pass at him, he had rejected them, though he remembered how he tried to make it up to them later by getting ice for their drinks, dropping them off in taxis when it was out of his way, because he had been afraid they would start to dislike him. He's been an ass. And he remembered, too, the humiliating moment when Vic Simmons had said, Oh, for Christ's sake, Tommy, shut up! When he said that to a group of people for perhaps the third or fourth time in Vic's presence, I can't make up my mind whether I like men or women, so I'm thinking of giving them both up. Tom had used to pretend he was going to an analyst because everybody else was going to an analyst and he had used to spin wildly funny stories about his sessions with his analyst to amuse people at parties and the line about giving up men and women both had always been good for a laugh, the way he delivered it, until Vic had told him, for Christ's sake, shut the fuck up. And after that, Tom had never said it again and never mentioned his analyst again either. As a matter of fact, there was a lot of truth in it, Tom thought, as people went. He was one of the most innocent and clean-minded he had ever known. That was the irony of the situation with Dickie. I feel as I've, Tom began, but Dickie was not listening. Dickie turned away with a grim look around his mouth and carried his drink to the corner of the terrace. Tom advanced toward him a little fearfully, not knowing whether Dickie would hurl him off the terrace or simply turn around and tell him to get the hell out of the house. Tom asked quietly, Are you in love with Marge, Dickie? No, but I feel sorry for her. I care about her. She's been very nice to me. We've had some good times together. You don't seem to be able to understand that. Oh, I do understand. That was my original feeling about you and her, that it was a platonic thing, as far as you were concerned, and that she was probably in love with you. She is. You go out of your way not to hurt people who are in love with you, you know. Of course. He hesitated again, trying to choose his words. He was still in a state of trembling apprehension, though Dickie was not angry with him anymore. Dickie was not going to throw him out, Tom said in a more self proposed tone. I can imagine that if you both were in New York, you wouldn't have seen her nearly so often or at all, but this village being so lonely. That's exactly right. I haven't been to bed with her, and I don't intend to, but I do intend to keep her friendship. Well, have I done anything to prevent you? I told you, Dickie, I'd rather leave than do anything to break up your friendship with Marge. Dickie gave a glance. No, you haven't done anything specifically, but it's obviously you don't like her around. Whenever you make an effort to say anything nice to her, it's so obviously an effort. I'm sorry, Tom said contritely. He was sorry he hadn't made more of an effort, that he had done a bad job when he might have done a good one. 
Well, let's let go, Marge and I are okay, Dickie said defiantly. He turned away and st stared off at the water. Tom went into the kitchen to make himself a little boiled coffee. He didn't want to use the espresso machine because Dickie was very particular about it and didn't like anyone using it but himself. He'd take a coffee up to his room and study some Italian before Fausto came, Tom thought. This wasn't the time to make up with Dickie. Dickie had his pride. He would be silent for most of the afternoon, then come around about five o'clock after he had been painting for a while, and it would be as if an episode with the clothes had never happened. One thing Tom was sure of, Dickie was glad to have him here. Dickie was bored with living by himself and bored with Marsh, too. Tom still had $300 of the money Mr. Greenleaf had given him, and he had and Dickie were going to use it on a spree to Paris without Marge. Dickie had been amazed when Tom had told him he hadn't had more than a glimpse of Paris through a railway station window. While he waited for his coffee, Tom put away the food that was to have been their lunch. He set a couple of pots of food and bigger pots of water to keep the ants away from them. There was also a little paper of fresh butter, the pair of eggs, the paper of the four rolls that Merlinda had brought in for breakfast tomorrow. They had to be small quantities of everything every day because there was no refrigerator. Dickie wanted to buy a refrigerator with part of his father's money. He had mentioned it a couple of times. Tom hoped he changed his mind because a refrigerator would cut down their traveling money, and Dickie had very definite budget for his own $500 every month. Dickie was cautious about money, in a way yet down at the wharf and the village bar. He gave enormous tips right and left, and gave 500 lira bills to any beggar who approached him. Dickie was back to normal by 5 o'clock. He had a good afternoon of painting, Tom supposed, because he had been whistling for the last hour in his studio. Dickie came out of the terrace, where Tom was scamming his Italian grammar and gave him some pointers on his pronunciation. They don't always say voglio so clearly, Dick said. They say io vo, presentare mio amica Marge per esempio. Dicky drew his long hand backward through the air. He always made gestures when he spoke Italian, graceful gestures as if he were leading an orchestra in a legato. You've been listening to Fausto more and read the grammar less. I picked my Italian up off the streets, Dickie smiled, and walked away down the garden path. Fausto was just coming in the gate. Tom listened carefully to their laughing exchange in Italian, straining to understand every word. Fausto came out onto the terrace smiling, sank into a chair, and put his bare feet up on the parapet. His face was either smiling or frowning, and it could change from instant to instant. He was one of the few people in the village, Dickie said, who didn't speak in the southern dialect. Fausto lived in Milan, and he was visiting an aunt in Mangibello for a few months. He came dependably and punctually three times a week between 5 and 5.30, and they sat on the terrace and sipped wine or coffee and chatted for about an hour. Tom tried his utmost to memorize everything Fausto said about the rocks, the water, politics. Fausto was a communist, a card-carrying communist, and he showed his card to Americans at the drop of a hat. Dickie said because he was amused by their astonishment at his having it, and about the frenzied, cat-like sex life of some of the village inhabitants. Fausto found it hard to think of things of talk about sometimes, and that he would stare at Tom and burst out laughing. But Tom was making great progress. Italian was the only thing he had ever studied that he enjoyed, and he felt he could stick to. Tom wanted his Italian to be as good as Dickie's, and he thought he could make it that good in another month if he kept working hard at it.